um, what always, and this is going to be my favorite question uh, to all the panelists. So I really want to know that, of course, when we are hiring people, when Qualcomm, l and Spica Works is hiring people, so definitely we look forward to some process skills. We look forward to some technical skills, which are a mandate, right? But uh, like Jayashree already spoke to us about attitude or presentation skills or, you know, the right interpersonal skills. So uh, my question is to Dr. Acharya and Gaurav and Jayashree and everybody again over here is that what do you think are the other key skills that, that an engineer would need in order to step up into an organization? So apart from the technical skills. Yeah, thanks. Sir. This is a, uh, you should know that you're asking this question to uh, some academicians. <laughs> we can go on and on. Yes. Right? There's no time. <laughs> and we've been in this industry and we have observed multiple segments of people right from laterals to freshers experience. Uh, so the, for me, uh, the only thing that I have seen in the last 34, 35 years is the number one uh, criteria is learnability. Nothing, nothing else. Attitude and other things will come. Definitely they will come. But uh, having a fantastic attitude, uh, but if he doesn't, if the person doesn't have a learnability in him or her, they, it's going, then they are going to saturate very fast. For example, uh, if I have to take my own case, uh, I came from a mechanical engineering background and the kind of work uh, over the last 34 years I've done, maybe 10% is mechanical. Rest, I have been in the embedded space, I have been in the telecom space, I have been in the aerospace, I have been in the automotive. I have traveled through multiple uh, companies like Honeywell, Infosys, KPIT Technologies. Each of these companies have given new uh, trend of technologies which we have to be embracing upon irrespective of age. Right, and do you have ability to sit with some of the younger most kids in the organization, learn from them? For knowledge, there is no barrier of from whom you learn. It could be from your kids. It's fine. So the number one attitude, therefore, in the mind is learnability. Do you have learnability? That's what I would look for. And how do we measure learnability? I sit on the interview of many of the young panel, uh, young engineers whom we hire in the company. I will always, though I can very easily ask a lot of technical questions to them. I park that aside because there are so many other people to ask the same questions. I ask the uh, people about, tell me what else you have done outside of your regular day to day nine to five job. Have you done taken up something which you did not know anything earlier and you started doing something? How did you learn from your colleagues? What new things you have done? You can see a spark in the eyes of people. Oh, come on. Somebody is asking me questions outside of what regular uh, panel members will ask. That is when you really start seeing uh, this the uh, spark in these people. For example, uh, some of the best architects that I have worked with, they are non-engineers. In my previous company, there was a software architect, an embedded system software architect who came from a commerce background. What else we can prove? Learnability is, is, the, is the key, right? For me, number one is learnability. I can go on and on, but I know my panel members are jumping to speak their words. I'll stop here. But I'm definitely very excited with this answer and, you know, I deal with a lot of students on an everyday basis. So I have taken a diligent note of it and I'm going to definitely pass this on. So, yes, Gaurav, coming to you on that. Yeah, no, I, I completely concur that uh, people, uh, so life is a journey and as long as you keep learning and adapting, uh, yes, uh, yeah, the success is ensured. Uh, for me, apart from that, uh, the key item that we look for uh, is the communication skills. A very, very basic stuff. Uh, uh, let's say I know everything, but I'm not able to share it with anyone. Then that knowledge is waste. Or if I have a question and I'm not able to ask the question properly, I will keep fumbling and, and looking for an answer. And there is a, a sea of people who have the answers, but I, I don't know how to get it out. So uh, that becomes a very, very important thing. More so in our industry where... Uh, Right now, projects are done across the globe, across geography, multi-site. You have to communicate with all kinds of cultures, all kinds of people, all kinds of time zones. And on top of that, COVID. I mean, uh, the biggest barrier that COVID has uh, uh, introduced is uh, uh, the, the body language is not visible. Most of the guys don't even turn on the videos, right? So if I'm not able to write my question or my communication properly or over the phone cannot communicate clearly, 
I am going to be frustrating the whole lot of people I am talking to. So for 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 us, uh, apart from of course um, uh, the basics, um, I mean engineering education or uh, attitude, communication is a key key, key criteria uh, that we look for while hiring anybody. Amazing. That was so on point. And I think uh, this kind of awareness and sensitization has to be developed among the, among the engineers. So I totally agree with you, Gaurav, on that. Uh, Jayesh, we have already spoken, of course, a lot about attitude and, you know, other skills. But, but is there anything more that you would like to add? I think both the panelists have covered it, but I'll, I'll add a few more and I'll be keeping it very short and sweet. A learnability, lifelong learning, because you are in a technology evolving era and you are in the semiconductor or whatever industry you are in. Technology keeps evolving, so you have to be a lifelong learner if you want to stick to this industry. And uh, what industry looks at is never give up attitude. And secondly, think innovative thinking beyond execution. Right. If you keep on doing only the execution work without even thinking what you're doing, simply follow the procedure and do it. That's not going to take you anywhere. And the commitment. Nowadays, what's happening is people get in all the, I mean, not all, uh, some of the newcomers, they will have something else in their mind. I have targeted that company. I didn't get it, but I'm in this company. But how do I get into that company? Right. Otherwise, MS, some other goals are there. But whatever it is, but be committed to wherever you're working and give 100 percent. And work without push. You are already there in the company. There are people who are still not getting the job. You have already got the opportunity. So work without getting pushed. And most important, communication and presentation skills. See, even if you take uh, uh, one example, let's say RTL design has to a designer has to give some instructions to the PD designer. It has to be communicated really clearly. Otherwise, it can it can spoil everything, right? And the uh, the cycle goes on and on and on. It never completes. And we are we are very particular about the time. Time for the market is very important for any company, right? So communication and presentation skills in bold. Amazing, amazing. I'm, I'm sure that message goes loud and clear to all our engineers and of course us, you know, have been training them. So Shiva, I know for sure that you have always been the biggest flag bearer of an engineer with great communication skills. You always tell even our learners and students have always seen that, you know, you just can't be happy with the technical skills. You have to be a combination, like a perfect combination of soft skills and technical skills. So what is your take on on this question, what do you have to say about it? Yeah, I, I agree with all the panel members. Uh, as uh, Dr. Acharya mentioned, uh, uh, continuous learning is very important. Uh, we always need to uh, look up to people like Steve Jobs. What about Steve Jobs? Um, college uh, dropped out. Uh, still, he was able to introduce devices like iPhone. Uh, think about that, right? Um, um, so what I do to inspire the engineers, uh, I work as author. I uh, create new courses. Uh, sometimes the trainers have a big question, right? What uh, Shiva is actually doing. Um, or if I go and tell them that, hey, we need to train the engineers on a risk file. Uh, it's a processor. Uh, the trainer might argue with me, like uh, all these years I have been uh, teaching digital electronics. I have been teaching system very long, uh, programming language. But now you are asking me to uh, teach the processor concepts. I can't do this. Then, OK, I can do it. So that's how uh, I create new courses. Uh, it's highly needed. Uh, it's good to follow the culture, walk the talk. Uh, you know, uh, th that's also very challenging for people like me uh, because I am uh, leading a company like uh, Maven Silicon and uh, here I have to uh, educate people, you know, why learning is something very important. Uh, you know, there are various reasons why we want to introduce new courses also. Uh, for example, risk file. Uh, we have become... Uh, an authorized training partner for RISC-V. Uh, when I interacted with 
the CEO of a risk five uh, non-profit organization, right? Uh, I uh, learned a lot about uh, their initiatives. And as an engineer, I thought like, it's really important for every chip designer to understand the processor design. Um, uh, uh, for example, uh, the question is, how can you train someone on digital electronics? You know, they are going to learn all these concepts, right? Uh, combinational logic or sequential logic. Uh, it, it would be something like learning all these concepts like bits and pieces. But what actually they are going to do with that? That's where we can show them processor as a case study. Uh, you know, processor demands all these components. Uh, they have to create components like decoder or uh, registers and then be a control logic. And that's where they understand, wow, uh, this is the real use of digital electronics. Not only that, they need to understand the big picture, how basically we use processor to build uh, chips or SOCs. Uh, Jayshree mentioned about it. Sometimes we experience a communication gap uh, when it comes to delivering the projects. Uh, you know, the article goes to PD, there is a communication gap. But the biggest issue we face in the industry is like VLSA engineers might not be able to interact with software engineers. There is a huge gap. People don't uh, realize this. Uh, it used to bother me a lot. Even I didn't have answer to all these questions like, uh, uh, how we do hardware software core verification or a basic question why we use c programming or why we use c test cases to verify the soc and i don't want the engineer to assume that system verilog is the most powerful language in the world which is wrong they need to understand there are different methodologies there are different languages so we use directed test case methodology to verify system on chip, we use C test cases. And everyone knows, but the engineer asks big question, why do we do this? System Verilog is the most powerful language. A randomization works beautifully when it comes to finding bugs, but whether this methodology is really scalable. And also the important question is why C test case? I tell you the reason. Um, when it comes to verifying the SOC, basically we try to do everything through processor. Processor is the one that is going to initiate all kinds of operations, right? So there will be firmware. And this kind of firmware, if you look at software guys, actually they write the firmware in C. So uh, you, you will always come across C test cases. That's where they also need to understand like how they can create the infrastructure, hybrid infrastructure, which is going to involve even methodologies like UVM also. Right? There will be some verification components in UVM, uh, and uh, there will be some legacy components in Verilog, but on top of it, the firmware is the one that will be loaded in the memory, and then processor will read that firmware code, and that's how the processor is going to initiate the operation. Then we really need to show them that the processor is the one that decides the boundary between hardware and software. They need to understand what is uh, instruction set architecture. Right? So personally, I wanted to understand the concepts uh, how we define the uh, boundary between hardware and software. That's why I wanted to create the course on my own, right? So uh, uh, this is what I'm here to uh, share with the next generation of engineers also. They really need to understand the big picture, right? And if you look at our Maven course, it starts with a detailed, a detailed module on SOC design, which covers every aspect of system on chip. Uh, you know, I teach them what is device driver, what is firmware, what is IP, what is subsystem, and why they need to learn certain protocols. Uh, you know, they always assume that, yes, I might want to deal with the UART, I might want to deal with SPI. You take any SOC, definitely there will be interfaces like UART or SPI or I squared C, and then uh, why they need to understand at least something like on-chip bus. That's how the course starts. And uh, sometimes they find it... Uh, little complex, but we have to give them the realistic picture also. Chip design is always going to be like this, right? So uh, that's what I would like to share with you all. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Shiva. That were some really good insights. So.